Sorry about that. When we began our study in the book of Acts, I mentioned to you that while all scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, the book of Acts is a transitional book. When you go into the book of Acts, it seems like except for one or two exceptions, every believer is Jewish. When you come out of the book of, of, of Acts, virtually every new convert is Gentile. In the beginning of the book of Acts, you have remnants of the law in a very Jewish society, and things are transitioning and changing. But then when you hit the next book of the Bible, which is Romans, Romans, Corinthians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, those are all discussions of the New Testament church. And so we're going to get into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, just finish the love chapter. And now abide with these things, these three, faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Jumps right into chapter 14. says, charity is the greatest, and pursue charity, pursue love, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now, prophecy in the Old Testament was foretelling the future. Prophecy in the New Testament is forthtelling understanding right from wrong, no shades of gray, it's black or it's white, and you can see it where uh, Paul puts his finger in Elimus's face, and he says, you're of the devil, and he struck him blind. I'm not looking to strike anybody blind, but the verses we're about to study talk about a contrast between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy, and why one and why not the other, and so we'll dig in. We see in verse 12, So with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Don't worry about building up self, but building up the church. So, the gift of tongues, a great divider. We're going to talk about the division. Romans 14, two different versions. Each one should be convinced in his own mind. Each one should be fully persuaded in his own mind. There are some folks that would say, if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not saved. There are other folks that say, if you do speak in tongues, then you're demon-possessed, or at least they'd say that is a doctrine of the devil. They're both wrong. The gift of tongues serves two purposes. And you're going to see they're very distinct between the purpose for the New Testament church where we live today and the purpose that it served during the book of Acts. Purpose number one, to enable some Christians to talk to God and not to other people. We'll cover those two verses in a little bit, verse 2 and verse 27. The second purpose, the second purpose is the Acts person, purpose assigned to unbelieving Jews, and we'll be covering those verses as well. The gift of tongues and interpretations. Purpose one, some people, the reason I emphasize some, is I know that I'm a Christian. I know that Jesus saved me. But I'll also tell you, I've never once felt compelled to speak in tongues. So it's a gift that would enable some Christians to talk to God. Note, not to other people. Here's the verse. For one who speaks in the tongue speaks not to other people, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. So now, that's the church purpose. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Peter spoke, but everybody understood him. And he was speaking not to God, but to people. You see, both of those are backwards. And he wasn't uttering mysteries. He was uttering, uttering perfectly clear that the people killed Jesus and they need to repent. Yet the people understood him. There was no interpreter. It just happened. 
So very, very different. We'll come back to that. Verse 27. If any speak in the tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and in each in turn, let some interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. And what we're going to see in the book of Acts is this. Yes, Peter had a great big speech. 3,000 people were saved, but there were many of the apostles speaking in tongues all at the same time. Very different. The interpretation of tongues is required if speaking in tongues is exercised publicly. This gift enables one to interpret to others the intent of meaning, the intent or meaning of what was uttered to God by those being interpreted. We didn't need an interpreter in chapter 2, and we didn't even realize in chapter 10 that people actually understood what was being said. It was just simply speaking in tongues. So, first question, tongues versus prophecy. Who's the audience? Who's on the receiving side? In the terms of, God, of tongues, God is the audience. In terms, in, ter in terms of prophecy, man is the audience. So there you see verse 2 again, and now let's read verse 3. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people. So what was Peter doing on the day of Pentecost? He was speaking to people. Why is there a gift of tongues? In the, in the situation of tongues, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. But in the case of prophecy, the prophecy is there for upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. You see that in verse 3. The one who prophesies speaks to the people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. If someone's speaking in tongues, he's speaking to God. So if he's speaking to God, where is the upbuilding, the encouragement, and the consolation? And later on, we're going to read that if someone is speaking to God in tongues, how can somebody say amen, so be it, if they don't know what they're agreeing to? Who is to be edified? We're up to verse 4. The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, builds himself up. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Peter tells us this. As each has received a gift, tongues is a gift, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Serve one another. Tongues serves self. And now we read the prophecy side of that. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. We're going to come, we're going to talk about an audience, and verse says, if, if an unbeliever walks into our assembly and somebody's speaking in tongues and there's no interpreter, that person will think that the attendees, they're crazy. Well, we'll get to that. Lord, give me both gifts. Give me tongues. Give me prophecy. Give me everything that you can possibly give me. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret it. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. There, an, an interpreter means somebody who can take whatever sounds are coming out of my mouth and translate them, in, into my case, into English. If there's no interpreter, then I'm not using my mind. I'm just babbling. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit but I will sing with my mind also. In the book of Romans, Paul said that he would pray with groanings that could not be uttered. There's a time in the prayer life when it's so intense that your mind is going faster than it can formulate words, but your mind is very much intact. 
And Paul said, I don't know what I'm supposed to pray for, but the, the spirit gives me utterance. I just groan in my prayer life. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? As far as somebody's concerned, I could be rattling off some curse words in some foreign language and somebody over in the corner says amen. Makes no sense. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. The other person's basically just burning daylight. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. This is Paul speaking, not me. I don't have that gift. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Intended for whom? Here we're going to see the tie-in to the book of Acts. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. So now this is going to get interesting because I just got done saying, if you're speaking in tongues, somebody comes in, they don't get the interpretation, they'll think you're crazy. Prophecy flips it the other way. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. And you're going to see that take a little interesting twist as well. So I just shared, I'll go back one. Tongues are a sign for unbelievers. So we're asking the question, what kind of unbelievers? Verse 21. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. Who is this people? The Jews. Through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. I'm going to double back and cover these verses. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Now, this is Paul writing the first Corinthians, and he's trying to tell them, don't be childish. The author of Hebrews says the same thing. He says, you should be mature and we should go beyond the topics of salvation and, and get into the meat of the word. He's saying, don't be babies about this thing, but, but grow up. In the law it is written by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, for unbelieving Jews. And there's the quote, it came from 1 Corinthians 14, 21, is a quote of Isaiah 28. For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. He's talking about the Jewish nation. So how does that fit into the book of Acts? Tongues in Acts. The apostles on the day of Pentecost, to prove to Jews that Christ was the Messiah. They were unbelievers. Peter gave his, his speech, and they said, what must we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. Peter with Cornelius, who was the audience? We said that certain believers came with P Peter from Joppa to Caesarea, and they were the ones that were amazed. They would say, wait a minute, John, those were saved Christians. They were referred to as brothers. They were Jewish brothers who did not believe that Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit. So it was proof to those Jews who could not, un who could not believe that the Holy Spirit could be received. We didn't get to chapter 19 yet, but here we see in chapter 19 where the message of the full gospel was taken to former disciples of John the Baptism, and it was to prove to those Jewish people who were saved who were believers, who were saved through John the Baptist's ministry, they didn't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. Therefore, they couldn't believe in a Holy Spirit. So the three samples of tongues and acts are each time addressed to Jews who did not believe something. So we're going to go through those details. Tongues and Acts chapter 2. And the divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Tongues doesn't say they took turns. 
It doesn't say two or three at the most. There were 120 of them. It says then they were all speaking something in other tongues. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from every nation under heaven. They were unbelieving Jews. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. There was no interpreter. It was a miracle. There's Peter speaking in whatever Galilean dialect he had. And all these people, almost 20 different nations, could understand them. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own na uh, native language? It was proof to the visiting Jews that Christ was the Messiah, and 3,000 Jews got saved. And there was our launching off point. We now come back to chapter 10. The believers among the circumcised, Jewish saved people, people who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. They couldn't believe that the Holy Spirit would fall on Gentiles and the Gentiles speaking in tongues was proof to those Jews who didn't believe it, they better believe it. The audience was believing Jews, but they did not believe the Gentiles could receive the Holy Spirit. And here's Peter, chapter 11. He's going and he's reporting back to the brothers in Jerusalem. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. The speaking of the tongues in Caesarea was proof to the believing brothers that came from Joppa, and it was proof to the brothers that were down in Jerusalem that the Holy Spirit was going out to all nations. Chapter 19. We're not jumping ahead in the narrative. We're concluding a topic of tongues. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country, and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we've not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Who began speaking in tongues? The people that were saved in John the Baptist ministry. Who was the audience? Believing Jews who did not know that there was a Holy Spirit. And therefore they couldn't believe in him. which takes us to verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your minds? I listened to a preacher in Philadelphia. His name is Joe Faust, and he's pastor of Calvary Chapel of Philadelphia. They have over 5,000 people in their church every Sunday. And he says, I speak in tongues. He said, but we're not going to speak in tongues in this service. He says, if we do, every crackpot within 100 miles will be here. So we're now down to that one lossage that says, effect on unbelievers? They'll think you're mad. Now, if I'm speaking in tongues, I've got an uncertain language. It's, it's not understandable. Think of a bugle of a trumpet. Think of the military, and every tune has a meaning, whether it's charge or retreat or reveille or taps or whatever it is. They all have a meaning. But if you don't understand what the trumpeter is blowing, you don't know what to do. Should I charge? Should I retreat? Should I go in my tent and go to sleep? Should I go eat? Isaiah 58 says this, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. 
Declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. And we read in 1 Corinthians, For if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? If I stand up here and rattle off some sounds that nobody understands, you've got no clue what I'm trying to tell you to do or what to believe. Unless you speak intelligent words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. So intended for whom? Unbelievers. In prophecy, we said it was believers, but now here's a curveball. It's for unbelievers so that they become believers. So verse 24, but if all prophecy, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Prophecy is intended for believers, but if an unbeliever comes in and he gets convicted, he'll become a believer. We'll continue on. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. You could have two, three hundred people in this room on a Sunday. If everyone shows up, and everyone wants to sing his own song. Everyone wants to read his own scripture. Everyone wants to share what's on his heart, let alone everyone wants to speak in an unknown tongue. Where's the edifying to that? Let all things be done for edification. Let all things be done for lifting up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each take their turn. Did they do that in Acts chapter 2? No. Did they do that in Acts chapter 10? No, they all spoke. Did they do that in chapter 19? No, they all spoke. The Acts tongue is very different than the rules and regulations spelled out for the New Testament church. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them kept, keep silence in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others consider what's being said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. For God is not the author of confusion. You've heard that many times. Let all things be done decently and in order. Tongues, the great divider. Let everybody convinced or let everybody be persuaded in his own mind. Acts chapter 11. Verses 1 through 18 are a narrative of Peter going from Caesarea down to Jerusalem and reporting back everything that had happened in Caesarea with Cornelius and his household. And so how was that message received? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So now we're going to see another shift. Peter, we saw where he started in Jerusalem, took a lap through Galilee, took a lap through Samaria, visited Lydda and, and, and Lystra uh, and Joppa and Caesarea, back to Jerusalem. And now we're going to see Antioch being pulled in, and we're going to see Barnabas and Saul of Tarsus get pulled in. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution, back to Stephen being stoned. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So there's a message going out but it's an exclusive message. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyrene is on the northern coast of Africa, closer towards Libya, not on this map. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. The first group, they were speaking to the Jews by race and religion. Here they're coming to those who are speaking of the Jewish faith, but of a different bloodline. 
Very similar back to Acts chapter 6, where the apostles had to name deacons because the Hellenists weren't getting the same treatment as the, as the Jewish, as the, the native Hebrew widows were. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. This report came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Why did they send just Barnabas? We hear them saying that send two here, send Peter and John over there. It was because they already had. Why did they send just one? It was because they already had the report of witnesses. The report of this came to the ears of the church. They had a report coming this way. So Barnabas wasn't going to Antioch to prove that it was so. Barnabas was going to Antioch to minister to those people. So Barnabas, the son of encouragement, is sent to Antioch. We've seen Barnabas twice already in scriptures. The first time he sold his field in Acts chapter 4 and gave all of the cash to Peter to, to help with the needy. We see him again when Paul and Saul of Tarsus first comes to Jerusalem. It was Barnabas who became the liaison. It was Barnabas who said, Saul of Tarsus, come here, I want you to meet Peter. And so now Barnabas is being sent to deal with young believers in Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them, son of encouragement, and he encouraged them. He exhorted them with, uh, he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. We left Paul, Saul of Tarsus, we left Paul in Tarsus. He had received Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He immediately started preaching in Damascus. The fervent Jews wanted to kill him. They lowered him outside the city halls by basket. He goes to Arabia for three years to connect the dots with Jesus. He goes back up to Damascus and does some preaching. Then he comes to Jerusalem to meet with Peter, and that's where uh, Barnabas introduced him. He was speaking to the Hellenists, the Jewish people who, uh, the, the Jewish believers who were Greek or Gentile origin, because he couldn't talk to the Hebrews. They all knew who he was. They would kill him. But they figured it out, so they sent him off to Tarsus to go hide. The Bible doesn't say what he did in Tarsus, but I can only imagine he spent his time talking about Jesus Christ. That's all, that's all he ever did until the day he was killed. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. Now, this is interesting. There's going to be a great famine over all the world, yet they sent their relief to Jerusalem. Antioch was also going to face that famine. These people, out of the abundance of their heart, shared whatever they could. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So there you see Barnabas and Saul trusted with the cash or whatever they gave them to take down to Jerusalem. And then they returned. We see that at the end of Acts 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now, this is interesting because when we start talking about the first missionary journey of Paul, he's being launched from Antioch. And so he had to get somewhere along the line from Jerusalem back up to Antioch. But he's also traveling not just with Barnabas, who started the trip down from Antioch, but they're also taking along with them Mark. The book of Colossians tells us that Mark was first cousins of Barnabas. So it's no wonder Barnabas wanted to take Mark on that missionary journey. It's no wonder when they're going to launch missionary journey number two, Mark said, uh, Barnabas said, I want, I want Mark to be coming with me. They were cousins. 
Paul saw it differently. We'll get to that one of these weeks. Acts chapter 12. Chapter 12 talks about the beheading of James, the liberation of Peter from prison, and the death of Herod. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. The church was already experiencing religious persecution. This is the first time they're facing political persecution. And when the Romans proper step in, they're going to be facing a religious and political persecution. So about that time, we're going to get to the Herods. I'll have a whole family tree for you. This is Herod Agrippa I. We'll get to it. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, now there's a, there's a crowd pleaser, right? If there was no other reason to kill, Jew, to kill James, it made the people happy. So when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And this was done during the days of unleavened bread, during the days of Passover. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending that the Passover, that after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to, to God by the church. Four squads, a squad is four. He's being guarded by 16 soldiers. We're going to see what happens to those 16 soldiers. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out of the prison, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, another 14 around, bound with two chains and sentries before the door guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up and says, hey, hey, get up, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. Now he wasn't naked. He was to put on, he had on an inner garment. He had to put on his outer garment, put on your shoes. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Grab whatever you've got. Let's get out of here. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. And so there's somebody took a photograph with their iPhone as he was walking out of prison. When they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. So there's Peter. He's thinking he has a vision. He's getting awakened from a deep sleep. When he wakes up, the chains fall off. The angel says, grab everything you got. We're out of here. They go out, and the door opens by itself. They walk past the sleeping guards. They go out onto the street. The angel's gone. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I'm sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. I'm not dreaming. And from all that, the Jewish people were expecting. They were expecting that next day for Peter to have his, his head chopped. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So this is John Mark, first cousin to Barnabas. And there were many gathered together and they were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Rhoda means rose. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. They're praying for Peter to be released. Peter gets released. He's knocking at the door. Rhoda says, the Peter's released. You know those prayers that we're praying about? He's here. And they're saying, you're crazy. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James. Now, this is not the same James because James, the brother of John, was just killed. He's talking about James, the brother of Jesus. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Tell these things to James and to the brothers. 
Don't know if that means the other physical brothers of Jesus or if he's talking about the spiritual brothers in the free pardon of sin. I think it's the latter. So Peter is rescued. And when that day came, there was little, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become to Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries. What's the, what's the penalty for a soldier who lets a prison get free? Death. He examined the soldiers and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So there you see Jerusalem on the very bottom of that map. You see Caesarea towards the, the west coast on the, on, the, on the coastline there, because we're going to talk about Tyre and Sidon, which are on the top part of that map. Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon up north of Israel. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered a speech that he would never forget. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. What did Peter say when, when Cornelius wanted to worship him? What did Paul and Barnabas say when they wanted to worship? We're men of like passions as you are. The people basically the same thing. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck Herod down because he did not give God the glory like Peter and Paul and Barnabas did. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. So you ask which Herod is which? You see on the top, Whoa, that wasn't supposed to do that. You see on the top, Herod the Great. Can you read that print from there? Herod the Great. That was the Herod that built Herod's temple. That was the Herod that killed those babies when Jesus had left from Bethlehem to Egypt. You drop down, you see the, on the brown line, those are some of his wives that had kids, and you see six other wives over on the corner. They didn't do anything for you. And there you see Herod Antipas. He was the Herod that Jesus stood before in his judgment times. Then you come down to Herod Agrippa I. It's now the grandson of Herod the Great, and he was the one who just now died. He was the one who killed James, wanted to kill Peter, gave this marvelous speech. The people were so impressed, they decided he was a deity. He didn't uh, tell them otherwise, and God struck him dead. And then it was his son, Agrippa II, that appeared, that uh, Paul appeared to him before he was sent off to Rome. You see Agrippa there. You see his brother-in-law, Felix was part of that same entourage. And that is my last slide.